I'll be reading two stories from Escaping Benzo Oz, a play. I know most people look at me and see a sweet-faced senior, but others take one look at me and say, pirate. It happens to me all the damn time. One evening, I had fireworks in my bedroom, but there was nobody cute there. It was my retina detaching again. As you can go blind, I immediately called my retinal surgeon. He asked the right questions, and I did not need to rush to St. Paul's for surgery, just make an appointment the next day. The nurse I spoke to said, cover your eye, keep it closed, don't use the computer, watch television or read books, and it might just reattach itself. A nap a lot, you won't mind, you're old. I was doing this on the telephone, but I didn't say it out loud because she was giving me helpful info. I mean, I didn't want surgery. So I wrapped an organic cotton dishcloth around my eye and dressed carefully for the farmer's market. It was a hot summer day, so I wore a strapless dress, high-heeled sandals, and a huge turquoise picture hat to distract from the bandage, because I felt like a dickhead. So there I was at the farmer's market, looking fetchingly feminine, if a trifle wounded World War I veteran. I'm about to start my shopping when a little girl comes out to me and asks, are you a pirate? I'm killing myself laughing inside, but I can keep my face straight with kids. And I looked down at her and replied, well, of course, me lassie, but I'm in my disguise as an ethical late middle-aged woman. How'd you guess? She knows I'm reconnoitering, so she looks to the left, she looks to the right, then points silently to the eye patch. I give her the thumbs up, wink at her with my good eye, and she walks off content. An hour or so later, she returns, but she's a different child this time, no longer shy. She spent an hour in the world of her imagination on a pirate ship. She has an invisible dagger on one hip, a sword on the other. She swaggers up to me and demands, but are you a real pirate? Uh-oh. Now I had to think about that long and hard. I don't believe in lying to children. When you're telling a story, they know it's a story, but I'm at the farmer's market in a strapless dress. I look down at her and realize she's about six or seven, about the age I was when I had the rat crap beaten out of me regularly by school bullies for the sin of being the littlest kid in class with a funny voice because of elocution lessons and big words full Shakespeare. Dad was a union leader and some kids' parents didn't think workers deserve fair wages, pensions, and benefits. Their kids beat up the Lawson kid. My mom ran for alderman in the 60s and some people didn't think women should work outside the home. Their kids beat up the Lawson kid. The Lawson kid got sick and tired of this. But bullies are little terrorists and say you and your family will die. So you don't tell until my mother discovered me sobbing my guts out in the basement, probably literally, as a bigger boy had been punching me in the stomach every day for a month. My mother closed the curtains and said, this will never happen again. You're gonna tell the principal's office? No. Tell his mommy on him? No. I didn't like where this was going, so I made a pre preemptive strike. I can't fight back. They're all way bigger than me. She told my baby sister to bite the neighbor baby who'd been biting her. The woman I now think of as mummy pirate looked down at me and said calmly, yes, you can learn to fight back, dear, and I'll show you how. She taught me a little judo, but I still look dubious. Out came the artillery, my family heritage. She said, your grandpa showed this to me when I was the littlest kid in class. And his daddy, your great grandpa, showed him when he was the littlest kid in class. Well, I worship my grandfather. He was a gardener, a little skinny Welshman, barely taller than me. But to me, he was a magical Merlin of a man. If grandpa thought I could do it, maybe I could. Now, the little kid's fight rules were very simple. Get in close, hit hard, run like hell. We were never allowed to swear in my family, so I knew this was a near sacred occasion. The next day, I was a transformed child. Instead of feeling the usual gut-clenching terror, 
I felt only anticipation. He glowered at me in class. Bullies feed off your fear. But this time, I was only acting. Sure enough, he came up to me after school, about to punch me in the stomach yet again. He threw what I now realize was a pretty flabby punch. I got in under his guard and it hit him hard right in the bread basket. Now, I was the littlest kid in class, so there wasn't a whole lot of strength. But I had the rage of two years of being bullied and beaten up and 30 days of being punched in the stomach by this kid. So I had the strength of 10 ridges plus two. He went down. I had one. He never hit another little kid again. Bullies are such cowards. I dance all the way home. In fact, I swaggered. Mummy, mummy, guess what I did? This all went through my mind in just a few seconds. Back at the farmer's market, I looked down at the little girl waiting my, for my answer and replied confident to, am I a real pirate? Well, of course, me lassie. I've got one ship in English Bay and anywhere there's a BC ferry, <laughs> they're mine. Now that's the truth too. There is a kid's pirate ship in English Bay. As for BC ferries, they admit it. 30 years ago, a friend was driving to Victoria to, to visit me in theater school, driving hell for leather as she always did. She arrived at the terminal only to discover they'd hiked the price of the ferry service sky high as they always did. She spluttered indignantly, that's highway robbery. The ticket taker smiled smugly, having been waiting for that line for days, weeks, or years. And responded, no ma'am, this close to the water, it's called piracy. So whenever you think the world is devoid of magic, just look around you, everywhere, pirates in disguise. And the second story is called Dancing Back to Life. When I was a young acting student, I studied everything from ballet to Afro jazz dance, because you never knew what was gonna help you get a gig. Soon I could fake anything to any kind of music you can dance to solo. To Celtic music, I danced a jig. To the Spanish guitar, imaginary castanets flew. You name it, my body entered that culture, felt its rhythms and moved. I always felt that my body danced itself, herself. Detached from the endless babbling of my busy mind, I let her have her way, watched in silence, and delighted in the results. It was a kind of meditation for someone who sucked at stillness. But the accumulated pain of 13 car accidents, fibromyalgia, and worst of all, a yoga injury put an end to that activity. The agony I felt after dancing just wasn't worth it, and the constant exhaustion meant I rarely had the energy even to try. Once in a blue moon, however, my dancer would reemerge. It was like a fairy tale, the one where the lame girl can skate one night a year. I'd wake up one morning just knowing, today I can dance. Cinderella gets to go to the ball, come home in her pumpkin carriage to no extra pain. Those were rare and magical moments that became fewer and farther apart as I grew increasingly disabled and housebound. The swelling swell spread through fat red toes into puffy feet, ankles, and finally my face looked like a pumpkin. The tiny dancing slippers replaced by Ronald McDonald shoes that didn't touch my painfully swollen feet. The dancer in me seemed to die and a part of my life went with her until I got off the dreadful and dangerous benzodiazepines, that sleeping pills for the innocent, the eager, and the doomed, and four other prescriptions. And to my astonishment, the energies of life began to flow once more from 70% disabled to 70% abled. Every day became a happy rebirth day, almost. Because my dancer did not return even when energy and clarity did. At the farmer's market one day, I heard a familiar lilt try to simple turn a slight kick. Oh, instant agony. 
My hip hurt. My knee felt damaged. I nearly wept. Really, that part of my life was over. Or was it? My dancer's a fighter, not a quitter. The right music playing and out flew a tiny bit of dancing here. Another bit emerged there. When feeling weak, I boogied in my chair. As it's on wheels, I could get a hell of a good workout. Slowly and gradually, the strength and flexibility came back. The old moves reemerged at 60. Removing the thyroid toxin triclosan in all its forms from my toothpaste to antibacterial everything transformed my cheekbones from hamster face to sharp and highly boned and my ankles from football size to the skinny white feet that came with the original packaging. <laughs> to celebrate, I bought my first pair of toe-touching pumps in 25 years. They were butter soft leather fuchsia ballet flats, ridiculously expensive to pamper my still tender tootsies. Now I plan to be the essence of sane and sensible on their first outing, walking across the street to the farmer's market, buying fruit and coffee, and then coming home. A very sensible plan. But what was it Robbie Burns said about the best laid plans of mice and Linda's? Because I saw my favorite Celtic band and my tightly clad toes tapped, I tried a kick essayed a turn. Oh my God, I went for the whole damn jig. It seemed like my body in the fuchsia flats, like the red shoes of fairy tale fame, were dancing me to death. No, they were dancing me back to life. Two hours later, thrilled to the tips of my fuchsia clad toes, I went home to no pain that night or the next. I'd done it. What the doctors said was impossible. I began to dance daily, anywhere and everywhere there's music, to transform emotional and physical pain for the sheer and wondrous joy of it, and just because I can. Somebody said I'd be doing a disservice to the universe if I didn't. So now every day is truly a happy rebirthday for me and my inner dancer.